Hello and welcome to episode 3. Are you still with me? Here's how I usually spend Saturdays or any time I had free time. As you can see we have a bed right here and as soon as I would wake up in the morning Tampa is always hot so I'd have my fan blowing cool air. Look at all that dust. Disgusting. Cool air right here on the bed. Something about the cool air hitting my head was important. Okay. As I said, I promised, here are the vintage horror books. These are pretty old, so I'll try to handle them with care. Uh, one of my favorites, the movie Treasury uh, Horror Movies, Tales of Terror in the Cinema, Alan Frank. Uh, Alan Frank was an author I really liked a lot. There's a cool shot of Christopher Lee. There were so many images of Christopher Lee in these old horror books that I really became a fan of Hammer Horror, Bela Lugosi. Sorry, this is a different format. The last format I tried to use was the webcam on my laptop. The quality was okay. The other time I used my uh, smartphone, but the smartphone took up a lot of gigabytes to upload, so I'm trying different things. Looking like something from a Misfits album cover. The Mummy, Karloff. Karloff, big influence. Uh, this this was a childhood favorite right here. And it um, kind of looks like in that movie, Get Smart, where the guy takes away the magnifying glass. And his really are, eyes are really that big. Frankenstein. And you, the, is that Peter Cushing as the Quaker oatmeal guy? the right thing to do. Uh, the Mummy. A lot of people like The Mummy. Of course she had color photographs. And The Wolf. Man, I was a teenage werewolf. It's bringing back so many memories of the old days. One day I'll probably get married and have kids and they'll inherit my horror book collection. But until time, until that time, they're mine, all mine, and so there we have it. Maybe that's from Scars of Dracula, one I picked up recently. The movie Treasury Horror Movies. This one, the cover has since disappeared with time. But don't worry, I was uh, recently at a used bookstore, Wilson's to be exact, so if you're local, you would want to take, uh, from Tampa, South Tampa, where I'm at, take Gandhi all the way to the Gandhi Bridge. You'll go into uh, Pinellas, and then you'll go to MLK, and at MLK, you make a left, and that would take you all the way down to uh, Wilson's Used Bookstore. It's actually uh, Wilson's book world and I find I found uh, a nice copy of Boris Karloff there with the dust jacket so what is this mysterious book this is like being in a HP Lovecraft movie sometimes as a kid I felt like I was the protagonist in a Lovecraft story because my biggest treasures in life were my old dusty forbidden knowledge books Films of Boris Karloff. And this sealed his fate as my favorite actor. I recently picked up from eBay Targets, which was one of his, probably one of his last great movies. Boris Karloff. It goes through a silent air. First, it goes through a biography. He was a really good character actor. In addition to playing all the villains he played, he played a lot of great characters. And then, um,. The Bride of Frankenstein, which a lot of people consider this a superior um, of the Universal Classic Monster movies. Invisible Ray. I should see that. I know, I'm sad. I'm not familiar with it. Mr. Wong Detective. This is filled with great treasures of Hollywood's forgotten past. The ghost that lives in the tombs of Hollywood Hills. And it's just
just a great book. The Comedy of Terrors, Roger Corman, probably based on a script by Richard Matheson. Target, so there it is. And Mad Monster Party. I mean, I picked up Mad Monster Party recently. DVD, I probably should have got the Blu-ray, but every year come for Halloween. It's one of my go-to movies. That and the Charlie Brown, um, it's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown. How could I mess that up? Anyway, we have Targets, and Targets is an interesting film in which Karloff plays an aging horror sto uh, star, you know, and his movies really are for the kiddies, and horror moved away from that. Um, in Targets, you see this... He looks like the all-American teen. He, he has everything going for him, uh, you know, a wife, family, they, they, it looks like there's a, a really close family unit, and then he just flips out and shoots everybody, and then he um, buys a bunch of guns, uh, climbs on top of a water tower, and starts picking people off on the highway, and you know, recently in the news we've had that story about someone that was shooting people from the highway, and then of course the classic one is uh, Charles Whitman, you know, who... Mr. Smart Guy, who A plus student, I guess he got a B minus one day and started shooting people. And uh, this really shows that horror has moved on, kind of to show you society's ills, like in falling down. And to me, it's a shame. I'm, I like modern horror, and I like my traditional British ghost stories or ghost stories in general, Irish ghost stories. Japanese ghost stories, Japanese yokai monsters, all that stuff. And then, um, but um, my heart is really into the old traditional monsters, particularly the werewolf. I don't. I think the werewolf is misrepresented in cinema. That's me. I'm, this is a great book for a Karloff fan. Karloff on television. It really was a good book. And it made a big impression on me. The next favorite actor of mine was... Uh, if you're going to pair... If you're going to have another actor you look up to, it's probably going to be Bela Lugosi. And, um... Oh, the videotapes I showed you in episode 2. This was pre-Sunco's video. There was no Sunco's video at the local mall you could drive to. Uh, to get a video cassette, you would have to... You'd have to go to the mall or go to a variety store like Zare's back in the day. I remember Zare selling VHS copies of Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, which features a spectacular fight between Gene Simmons in full makeup using very bad karate against a robotic Frankenstein monster that must be seen to be truly appreciated in its awfulness. And again, uh, here's another one of them, uh, the films of the Lugosi. And some of the best, scariest Universal movies were those, uh, the, the Raven, uh, the Black Cat, where you had the uh, Karloff Lugosi team up. So those are traditional monsters are fun, but there is some kind of pretty gut wrenching scenes, like the ending of one of them where Bell Lugosi has Boris Karloff tied up and says, I'm going to skin you alive and when my dad explained to me what, what that meant it really bit my imagination imagine somebody would be slowly killed and and that kind of pain really bothered me i got over it but you know bell lugosi he was a a refugee from uh, his native hungary and he, so he had the authentic Dracula accent that um, even Christopher Lee couldn't really duplicate that classic old European charmy accent. There it is, there's the scene where Lugosi has that line and I'm going to say it was from the Black Cat. For some reason I thought it was the Raven, I did want to say it. I, I was out, but it's okay. the Bell Lugosi book and the Invisible Ray so they must have both been in the Invisible Ray we've seen that in the Karloff and now the Lugosi book so going through all this stuff the classic Frankenstein movies but I have nothing better to do 
I, I love House of Frankenstein, yeah. The Universal uh, Frankenstein series, I think, stood up better than the um, Dracula sequels. And this is, um, yeah, it was good times back then. And again, I've recently upgraded to a Films uh, of Bell Lugosi, a nice hardcover edition with a dust jacket that was found, plug, at uh, Wilson's Book World. This one, the dust jacket has since disappeared, and I forgot what was on the dust jacket. We have horror films by Alan Frank, British writer who um, did a lot to expose kids like me, and British kids and kids who could get their hands on this book to horror. Now, this is a classic horror scene here, you know. I, I think this is really what the horror story is when it's at its best, the mystery. See the stranger all in black, uh, like Clint Eastwood, the, um, the unknown, unnamed gunslinger. You have the mysterious body, the boat, water, water symbol of death. A lot of classic uh, horror images right there. This was another one. Just used to spend Saturdays flipping on the pages. And this one has a message to the uh, friend who gave this to me. Congratulations on your graduation a year later. Uh, a lot of luck and love from your Uncle Matt Muck and Aunt Carol. Or Uncle Matt. 1978. So that was the year I got these books. Eh? Bella Lugosi, yeah, the images are so good in these these black and white steels. But there came a point later on when I was a middle school student where I um, it was painful. I mean, I, I spent half a day crying about this, but I had to say goodbye to the traditional Frankenstein monster and Dracula and. Um, face up to modern horror and modern horror to me was creep show john carpenter's remake of the thing the evil dead the first nightmare on elm street movie 1978's dawn of the dead where the traditional um classic horror movie examples kind of faded away into the sunset it's sad and you know i like to romanticize but um uh, you Universe's Dracula can't compare to the shock value of um, some of those sinister grindhouse movies that came out in the 70s, which, you know, something like, or even a mainstream film like, uh, more like, well, it probably wasn't mainstream at the time, but everybody's heard of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then you had all those, um, Maniac and all those basket case, all those movies, that, great movies that came out during that golden age of Grindhouse. And that, you know, kind of sealed the final nail in the coffin of your classic movie monsters. And with um, Norman Bates and Psycho, as Kim Newman put it in Nightmare Movies, horror shifted away from monsters altogether, which made me sad and focus on serial killers and now we have too much serial killers there's Dexter, there's Hannibal Lecter that it just uh, keeps going on in that direction thank you Robert for Psycho no I mean it had to be done the genre had to change after decades and Hammer Horror I mean I could spend an entire Saturday on nothing but Hammer Horror and recently I got a gift card from work, so I was glad to be able to pick up, um, don't tell me, the TV series, and it's wonderful. Uh, you can find it cheaply. I got it for free with my $25 gift card, so it was under $25. Uh, Hammer's House of Horrors TV series. I believe it came out in the early 80s. I want to say either 1980 or 1981. It's worth watching every episode. Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter. And you have all kinds. I've never seen the film, but I know the photograph. Some of these I, I have 
haven't seen the film, but I know the photographs pretty well. And my love of roaches, if there's anything that terrifies me in real life, it's roaches. And can you imagine waking up to a bug in your eye? I mean, Florida, the bugs here are huge, so could happen one day. I just wouldn't want to be drinking coffee and have one popping their head up with those two shrimp-like antennas saying good morning. And so, Alan Frank, the man, a legend in his time back then. And then um, we've already looked through the vampire cinema. Pretty much uh, covered this one already in episode two, so you slackers can go back to that one. This one was one that I absolutely loved. Uh, I believe this one is, yes, Richard Davis, the Encyclopedia of Horror, and that classic Karloff look with that Jack Pierce's wonderful makeup. And when you open it up, it's got this um, straight out of EC Horror Comics. EC Horror Comics really had an impact on horror, and particularly when they did Creep Show, it was like a love letter to EC Horror. And that's the way Stephen King wrote it. I've always loved that red eye. And this this is good. This actually gives you uh, a lot of the literary horror traditions as well as the movies. I've always Peter Cushing, my hero. I mean, let's face it, there's been Van Helsens in different movies, but even when I read the Dracula novel today, it's Peter Cushing who I picture as Van Helsing. Or I surely don't picture Anthony Hopkins. He, he was good at what he did, but he's no Peter Cushing. He's a Hannibal Lecter, not a Helson. So, this was good stuff back in the day. It was weird. It was arty. It was King Kong. Giant octopuses. There were so many you know, big monsters. There we go with the bugs in your eyes. People with deformities. I mean, uh, people and worms. Frankenstein. Evil Frankenstein. Nobody really liked that one, but I've always liked the makeup. Sometimes I'll watch a bad horror movie for the makeup. Uh, the makeup may be great. Vampires, vampires, vampires. And werewolves. Shameless plug. My buddy is directing horror movies, independent horror movies, in Kansas City, Missouri, and he has one called Bone Hill Road, which is currently in production. I urge everyone to uh, go out and see it when that comes out. My favorite werewolf movies. It's a tie with me between The Howling and American Werewolf in London. And a close second is Silver Bullet. Those are my top three. And if you're going to uh, watch Silver Bullet, you might as well read uh, Stephen King's Psycho of the Werewolf. When I was 15, that book meant a lot to me. The gorgeous illustrations. I believe it might have been uh, the horror comic King, Bernie Wrightson. And uh, yeah, reminiscing about horror. What else am I going to do on Saturday? Go outside? Probably not. <sighs> Wonderful pictures. These, and this was um, essays by different people. So a lot of folks, uh, writers, got together to put this together. Oh, yes. Hammer's um, The Mummy with Christopher Lee. About to get his tongue cut out. Dawn of the Dead. All kinds of cool stuff. Which, um, I've always wanted a car like this. I was always intrigued by this. Incredible Shrinking Man. I mean, Richard Matheson really wrote some great horror, sci fi, sometimes crossovers. Um, Still to this day, my favorite horror novel is I Am Legend. I read that when I was 18 or 19, just out of high school, not sure if I wanted to go to college or get a job. Confused about a lot of things in life, and the, the I Am Legend book really spoke to me at the right time. 
And in this one, you get a breakdown of uh, horror comics. This is a real. This really had a lot of information. And probably my favorite is all these wonderful horror comic covers in here. And since, I mean, I was on my way to collecting horror comics. And anytime I could find EC uh, reprints, Vampirella, uh, Tomb of Darkness, which was Marvel's kind of take on EC horror comics. Uh, the Charleston group, they did these, like, ghostly tales or tales that witness madness and ghosts and things. Or, that's not really a title, I just made that up, but they had all these ones like Ghostly Tales and Midnight Tales might have been one. But yeah, all these great uh, comics and the films. You get the year, the directors, who distributed it. And the big attraction for horror is I was always into art. I was always drawing pictures and I don't think there's any better art for advertising than the, all the rich colors in these old horror movie posters. They really put a lot into this and one of the reasons I still have these old books around is to go back and look at how advertisers used to get people to get into the theater. It's that which is getting harder to do. Now this book is old and it's seen its day but again I found it at Wilson's Book World and um, this is all right. So I read Frankenstein, and Frankenstein is a childhood favorite. But um, if you read the if you read the novel, it's mostly a dialogue uh, with a debate between the monster and Victor Frankenstein. They just go back and forth arguing, and when you read it, you're like kind of bored. So the movies really made Frankenstein's monster come alive and kind of become this kind of incredible Hulk type character. But my favorite novel of the three classics, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde being the others, Dracula. And I've had this book forever, so much so that the cover is coming off. But now I've recently upgraded to the hardcover with the dust jacket. The Annotated Dracula uh, by Leonard Wolf, and Leonard Wolf grew up around Transylvania. Uh, he uh, immigrated to the U.S. I believe he teaches he teaches at a university. I don't I'm not sure if it's in San Francisco. It's somewhere in California. He did these wonderful books. Uh, I believe in the might have been the 60s or possibly the 70s. Dreaming of Dracula, how Dracula, how he grew up in, around Transylvania and Dracula just captured his imagination the way it captured my imagination. And I always love these illustrations and they're by art by Sati. And I mean, I tried to read Dracula at a young age, but what caught, what caught my eye was I tried to get to some of the illustrations in here. So you get pictures of what it was like back then, you get the text, you get a whole nice page of annotations. My particular favorite, and this became a Halloween tradition. I mean, people have Christmas traditions, Thanksgivings, this became my official. Um, when you're reading Dracula on the second page, Jonathan Hawker, um, He's, he, he writes in his diary that um, on his way to Castle Dracula, he stopped at an inn and he had um, what was a chicken paprika. And there's a recipe for chicken paprika over here. And I was rereading re Dracula and I'm like, I'm going to do that. So every year on Halloween, I go to my local supermarket, which for me is Publix, and I make chicken paprika according to this recipe. If you don't want to follow this recipe, there's wonderful, um, wonderful recipes on YouTube from um, Hungarian immigrants and anyone who's just a good cook that will get you on the way to making um, chicken paprika. And I buy um, the egg noodles to put it over. You could buy those German potato noodles and have fun with it. 
But yes, yeah, so you get beautiful photos. You get all these great little illustrations. And but for my money, my favorite picture in these books was these wonderful illustrations by Satie. Here's one right here. Artwork is so good. It's so detailed. It made me want to, you know, this was one of my all-time favorites. See how that bat is. And I'm going to go to the side so we can get the full effect. But you see how the mum, um, bat is. The moonlight shining down. It gives it me kind of a dark, scary castle. The uh, stars blinking up there. Reminds me of a trip to the Tampa Theater in a way. But this... And, uh, yeah, it just, it's the whole novel of Dracula annotated by a professor of English and Romanian culture and a Dracula vampire expert, uh, Leonard Wolf. I believe his daughter is an activist for women's rights now. Uh, very smart, very unusual family. Uh, and you, you get... You get a little bit more as you get to the end of the annotated Dracula the appendixes, which okay, you get a map of Transylvania, you get a map of England and Wales, which Whitby and the neighborhoods, a map of London all kinds of maps, a calendar for events that happen in Dracula if you want to find out what day of the calendar certain events happen. You get Dracula on stage and um, the influence Dracula had before the movies. I found this very detailed and fascinating and a selected filmography and the first one of course is Nosferatu, Dracula, I love the Todd, Todd Browning film. I don't think the uh, Universal sequels had the same impact of me on me as the uh, Hammer ones. And you get horror of Dracula, Dracula Prince of Darkness, Taste the Blood of Dracula. These were all great. I think they believe they're missing the Dan Curtis Dracula. That's a good one. The many different English language and foreign language editions of Dracula. A bibliography of all things of vampire. A detailed index. So there's many different annotated versions of Dracula. And this is a creepy picture to me. Uh, because there you go, you just see the coffin and dust. So if you, according to the Dracula mythology, Dracula must return to a coffin with his native soil. So on the front cover, you notice he was in the coffin. He's not coming after you, but... Oh, no! He's not in there. Where is he now? And with that, that's going to end episode three. In episode four, more madness, the insanity. In fact, it was, un it was unnameable so ghastly it made me mad i cannot describe the creature at the ending of the story that you took so long so long mr lovecraft just tell me what it looked like no i cannot it is too horrible lovecraft describe your entities no i can't i am mad i am providence providence and with that enjoy your days off because it's saturday folks i recorded this later than um episode two so i'm going to i don't know i'm gonna watch hammer house of horror on dvd and with that stay scared until episode four